by Sri Lanka's best internet package for online learning and online working with many amazing offers. Call 1212 for more information. Sri Lanka Telecom. Lenka, tu kuma wedi karaga ne? Lao ju rupyal panhata du kala. Mama, en api te ekak bom. Tonight, digging deep. Legal framework for petroleum-related investments to come next year. Helping hand to go global. Racing foreign currency at the Colombo Bourse to become a reality soon. We're in the last stages of potentially getting that through. Hard task made harder. People urge to cooperate with health authorities as Sri Lanka's COVID-19 death toll rises. This is a voluntary test that we are not forcing it, but people should be cooperative. Easter tax. Former President Maitripala Sirisena's personal security officer too suffers from forgetfulness. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Saturday, the 28th of November, 2020. Nava Sunlight Sakura. Then, Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Mal Suandin. From Ada Verana, this is Ada Verana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamma Kate Michael. Let's start with your local stories. Now, Minister of Energy Uday Gammampila stated in Parliament today that Petroleum Development Act will be presented to the Parliament next year to address the necessity of a legal framework to ensure the protection of large-scale petroleum-related investments. Meanwhile, the opposition calls the mooted 1 trillion rupee investment for the national plan on water supply too ambitious while implying that funding it, uh, funding it from the country's revenue would be a difficult task. These remarks were made when the expenditure heads of several ministries, including the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Water Supply and Power, were taken up for debate today. सामान्य पहले विभागे तो दिन नियम कर लाते हैं। इससे विषय के जानवरी में आसे जहाँ आटा बने द आसी टे विषय हाथ पन दा दाख पत्ता वा सातिया देखा तो ले आप इटे में पासल विरुद्ध किरी में असीरुता आ जाती है ना। अभी तो तीन नए गांठ बनो आकमेत तेन हो ए विभागे कल देंगे ए एक ना ताम � Pilihan menteri itu mage, na dua pilih bandar. Siapa anda orang yang katuna? Dedas pahlawan itu, itu mawa. Hiru bari itu katte. Yang kisi putgil itu laba dunna papa cara naya. Swaccha men laba dunnu badan makki lude tiaga na. Nebata tabia cina dikarnya sampur men malu tin dua laba di latin wa. Ema papa cara naya baragan na back ye la. E papa cara ni visikara itu passe. Pilihan menteri itu mage virudda ba. Kisi indu evidence katne. Ita pasnya huat awal dua ratus atlet tiaga ni, nakin ada tamu untuk desa pal nawasian tamu untuk pertimbangan yang kira. Adian warta anu aman nara madroni sebabi kawaiu gana adi trillion an amya kat asan nawaiu ni di sa barrel billion dekak paman ikmau tel ni di dekak sama ke aman nara madroni sakria khani jatel padat iak sanat kerla tiyan. Mema bim kota sehi wedi dua ratus pahati na khani jatel hamui me wibawa taw sevi min sudusu ayojikian soya gani masandad sila an power limited kian ayatane samagamat मेरा अवॉर्ड करा है भाई और उद्दाक तूला किसी मत ये रने आकरण ने गिना पो आयो जो के नेवत यावला तीन वा मन्ना रण ड्रोनीय एम देखा कि न केवल ले गवेशन आराम बकरा ने माइंड राज्य बक्स जनावर तुम्हारी युगे लिंग हाथरे इन तुनाक मसार तकाई एनं कोटेल एन देदाल सिकुलाई दी में कैनीम कर वो इंडिया नु समागम गैस संपत लेबुना डट पासे यह के मूल दुष्करता हिंदा इंडिया नु समागम यु अत्तला किया में तेल कर्मां ते आयोजने कराने डॉलर मिलियन वाली नवे बिलियन वाली में वाके आयोजने कावट किया ट कराने तमंगे आयोजने सुरक्षितता व तहावरु करना � Laban awak wasser yang muladi, api ini niiti me ramu, kandte tel sampat sangwardan panata vidya ta me garu parlimen tu dekiri patkan bala purutin. Minne me muli kawasita itu kala ata fasse tamai api, karma antiri gila inna pera te ayu jenikaran dekini illi makale yutte. 
කනිතෙල් නිතිගස් සංස්ථාව කෝටි 34899ක නයකින් කනිතෙල් නිතිගස් සංස්ථාව පිළිනවා. ඒ වගේම විදුලි බල මණ්ඩලයේ ගත්තොත් කෝටි 13075ක් නැහැ. සියලු බොරතෙල් ආනයනය කරලා පිරිපහදු කරලා දෙන්න පුළුවන් නම් අදත් අපිට වෙලඩපොලේ මිල 130කින් අඩු කරලා දෙන්න පුළුවන්. තෙල් පිරිපහදු වෙන අතුරු පළවලින් පොහොර නිෂ්පාදනය කරා. අපිට යූරියා පොහොර ෆැක්ටරියක් තිබුණා. 1981 දී අපේ පොහොර සමාගම මෙට්‍රික් ටොන් 50000ක් පාකිස්තානයට යූරියා ඇරියා. හැබැයි අද ඇටයක්වත් නිෂ්පාදනය කරන්නේ නැහැ යූරියා. මොකද තමුන් වහන්සේලාගේ දේශප්‍රේමය? තව සති දෙකක් ඇතුළතදී. පළවෙනි ලක්දණුයි බලාධාරය ආරම්භ වෙනවා. ඒ වගේම මේ එන මාසය අග වෙනකට අපි විශ්වාස කරනවා දෙවෙනි LNG බලාගාරයට අවශ්‍ය. ඇන්ඩර් කැන්දීම සිදු කරන්න පුළුවන් වෙයි කියලා. උමා ඔය වාරි මාර්ග ඇමතුමා උමා ඔය අපි පෙබරවාරි මාසයේ වෙනකට අවසන් කරන්න ටෝනි කියලා. दिदास दाना में वर्षे मेरा टे जनने करने लगू निष्पादने करने लगू मूल्य विदुली एक का संख्याव एक का बिलियन दास या एक का एक के किंग रुपया लक अडू उन्हों इतने न मुदल किये थे रुपया बिलियन दास है एलएनजी वाले इंग अपिका तो मांगे तो रुपया दाह तक वाटे अपिता एक के के मिलते आगे न पुलवा ලාබී විශ්වාස කරනවා ආණ්ඩුවක් විදියට මේ ඉලක්කය අපිට හමාගෙන යන්න පුළුවන්. There is a very ambitious program that have been outlined in the budget which talks about water for all national plan. It is planned to invest they say 1 trillion in 2021-2024 in 1000 community water projects, 171 major projects aimed at enhancing the production capacity, new water supply schemes and expedite the ongoing projects with the objective of ensuring access to drinking water to the entire population. It is also planned to enhance the local value of this project by engaging local engineers, contractors at national as well as rural level. 1 trillion rupees within a period of 3 years. to be spent on public utility such as purified water is a very welcome feature it's a good thing for succeeding government to continue with the project that the earlier government started since 1 trillion is supposed to be allocated the question as to how we are going to find the money for such a large investment is a serious question way back in 2014 it was the same regime that is in power now which changed the government policy on capital investment to the sector by asking the national water supply and drainage board to bear the major portion of debt servicing responsibility and they hardly any money was allocated from the consolidated fund i would like to ask from the honorable minister whether this policy has now been reversed we propose to yes. have this money allocated to us fully and also to cut down a large amount of cost yes. that we have been incurring through unsolicited proposals which has been your way of doing it we are going to have entirely national contractors taking the contracts out right. there will be treasury guaranteed local funding from our local banks the minister of finance the prime minister said planned annual utilization of foreign loans as agreed with the world bank asian development bank and japan international cooperation agency alone is a approximately us dollars 1400 million and in addition it is expected to obtain bilateral development loans approximately us dollars 400 million now a key aspect of the public investment financing strategy is a utilization of domestic funds as much as possible to support the implementation of the development of national infrastructure providing access to the rural economy if i am to understand this the government intends to allocate from the consolidated fund 1 trillion within the next 3 years which is in my opinion very difficult target to reach if it is to be funded purely out of our revenue safe card hand sanitizer navathama nishpadana pela neeru ki matti vekata lanka fe palam warata handunwa dena meli pen veggie cracker crunchy veggie Health authorities are continuing to urge people to cooperate particularly in conducting PCR tests saying that it is essential in breaking the COVID-19 chain. The calls come amid reports that people in some localities are refusing to volunteer for PCR testing. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's coronavirus death toll shot past the 100 mark with eight virus-related fatalities being confirmed late yesterday. Eight more fatalities were added to Sri Lanka's COVID-19 death toll yesterday. It comes as no surprise that all of them were recorded from the Colombo district with seven fatalities being confirmed within the Colombo municipality. This pushed the island's COVID-19 death toll to 107. One of the deceased was a 36-year-old, while others were above the age of 50. All eight victims had suffered from underlying health conditions, 
with one being a cancer patient who was being treated at the Apeksha Hospital in Maharagama. Though the country's total number of COVID-19 fatalities is now at 107, it is alarming that 94 of them have been confirmed during the second wave of the virus. The remaining 13 deaths were recorded during the first COVID-19 wave which hit the country in early March. From the total death toll, number of persons who perished between the ages of 10 to 30 are 3, while 4 victims were reported from the age group of 31 to 40. 16 persons between the ages of 41 and 50 are also among those who succumbed to the virus. Meanwhile, 21 persons from the ages between 51 to 60 have also died owing to COVID-19, while 20 victims were between 61 to 70 years of age. It was communicated from the inception of the outbreak that the elderly people are most at risk, and the numbers confirm just that, since 43 persons above the age of 71 have fallen victim to COVID-19 so far. In the meantime, 473 COVID-19 patients were reported from the island yesterday, with the District of Colombo reporting 138 infections, the most from any district. In the Gampa district, there were 63 confirmed cases yesterday. 35 of the remaining cases were recorded from the Ratnapura district, while the Kalutara district reported just three. There were 37 confirmed infections spread across 10 other districts. From yesterday's tally of infections, 197 are those whose residents could not be proven. In other developments, measures were taken again to conduct surveillance operations in the areas of Atalugama using drones and helicopters. Health authorities also requested the people within the area to cooperate as the locals had displayed an aversion to PCR testing. We can see that in some places people are not volunteering to come in forward for the PCR testing. We are doing the PCR testing is a simple test to identify COVID-19. The recognized methodology all over the world is identifying COVID-19 patients as early as possible, isolate them from the other people and also to investigate the close contacts of the patients and identify more cases and quarantine those who are not having the disease to ensure that they will not spread the will not get the disease and spread to the other people. So this is that very much essential to control or break the chain of this COVID-19 spreading. Because of that, it is the duty or it is the responsibility of the, all the citizens to come forward for testing with the COVID-19. This is a voluntary test that we are not forcing it, but people should be cooperative. Otherwise, what will happen is they will get ill. Sometimes it will be ended up with complications. If there are some elderly people in the home, there is a very high risk that they are getting the disease and also that end up with death. So because of that, it is the responsibility of all the citizens of the country to come forward when it is necessary and tested for COVID-19. Elsewhere, residents in the area of Batalandavatta in Ragama, who are currently under quarantine curfew, engaged in a protest today. They voiced their struggles in getting access to food and essential goods. The protesters, however, dispersed after the OIC of the Ragam police assured them that, that they would be provided with relief within two days. In another development, a 21-year-old expectant mother who was taken for PCR testing had reportedly suffered a miscarriage. After her husband was confirmed with the virus and was directed to undergo treatment, health authorities took measures to direct the entire family to the Diyatalava quarantine facility. At the end of her home quarantine period, following her return, she was admitted to the Castle Street Hospital for women with bleeding. The doctors had determined that her womb had been damaged. We will see you shortly after this break. Stay with us. Salem Bank, the bank with a heart. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, former President Maitripala Sirisena's personal security officer too is struggling to recall any phone calls received from the former Director of State Intelligence Service during the time when the former President was in Singapore in the days leading up to the Easter Sunday string of terrorist attacks. While testifying before the Commission, uh, which, pro which is probing the attacks, the former President's PSO was told that there are discrepancies between his statement given to the Commission's police unit and what he said before the Commission. To that too, the former president's PSO cited inability to recall. Former President Maitripala Sirisena's personal security officer Priyanta Pushpakumara, who handled the former head of state's mobile phone when he was in Singapore, gave evidence before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing the Easter Sunday terror attacks yesterday. 
The state's additional Solicitor General asked him as to who accompanied the former president to Singapore. The witness said that the former president's spouse, personal physician, a senior superintendent of police who was the chief security officer and himself accompanied the former president. He was then asked by the additional Solicitor General whether the former president's children took part in the trip. The witness replied that the former president's son who was there ahead of them joined them and that there is a vague memory of the other two children also joining them. The chairman of the commission then reminded the witness that though he admits that the former president's children joined the tour, he did not mention that fact when recording a statement with the commission's police unit. To that the witness said, quote, I did not have any recollection then. I called several people afterwards and learned the facts, unquote. The chairman of the commission asked the witness whether former President Sirisena had gone to Singapore prior to 2019 for medical treatment. The former president's personal security officer's response was that he has no recollection of the former president visiting Singapore prior to 2019. The chairman of the commission asked the witness on which dates did the former president attend the Mount Elizabeth Hospital for treatment. The witness replied that the former president visited the hospital sporadically and was never admitted to the hospital. The chairman of the commission then told the witness that he had given a statement to the commission's police unit saying that the former president was at the hospital during the entire day on the 20th of April. To that, the witness said that it has been a while since he made that statement and he cannot recollect it. The Commission's chairman told the former president's personal security officer that there are discrepancies in the statement he has given to the Commission's police unit and the testimony given before the Commission. The additional Solicitor General, meanwhile, focused on the call records of the former president's official mobile phone, which was handled by the witness. She said, quote, from the 18th to the 21st of April in 2019, there had been 43 calls to the former president's mobile phone, which was handled by you in Singapore, while the former president's Padded Road residence. Seven calls have been made from the phone which was with you to the Padded Road residence. Doesn't it mean that the former president made calls from the phone which was with you with regards to his requirements? Unquote. The witness responded, quote, no calls were not only made over the President's requirements but over our requirements too. Besides, since the President was engaged with the family, their calls too came to this phone." Unquote. Then the additional Solicitor General asked the witness whether a call was received from former Director of the State Intelligence Service Nilantha Jayawardhana at 6.16pm on the 20th of April in 2019. The witness responded in the negative. The additional Solicitor General then asked the witness whether Nilantha Jayawardhana called the phone which was in the witness's care on the day of the attack at 7.59 a.m. via the Padded Road residence. The witness said that though records shows that a call has been received, he has no recollection of it. The additional Solicitor General told the witness that he could not possibly forget about the call since it had lasted over two minutes. The personal security officer of former President Maitri Pala Sirisena responded, quote, It has been around one and a half years since this call was received, so I have no recollection of it. Unquote. The chairman of the commission then put to the witness that according to his statement to the commission's police unit, calls which came for former President Sirisena was connected with him and that witness had told the police unit that the two relevant calls too would have been put through to the former president. When the witness replied that it could not be, the chairman of the commission asked him whether he signed the statement without reading it. The witness's response to that was that he did sign the statement after reading it first. The Mahaviru Day, which celebrates the fallen members of the terror group LTTE, was held in some areas in the north under the guise of remembering the Tamil people who died during the conflict. They come despite there being several court orders banning such events which promote the terror organisation. Police media spokesperson D.I.J. Ditroana said that a Catholic priest found commemorating the fallen LTTE cadres in defiance of court orders was arrested in Jaffna. Enjoining orders have been issued by 10 magistrate courts of the country recently, preventing the commemoration of members of the LTTE on what is known as the Mahaviru Day due to the organization being a proscribed terrorist organization. Our correspondent stated that security was tightened in the north yesterday to prevent the commemoration of the Mahaviru Day. In such a backdrop, the Mahaviru Day was celebrated in some areas of the north under the guise of commemorating the Tamil people who died during the conflict. 
Meanwhile, police media spokesperson DIG Ajit Rohan stated that a 47-year-old Catholic priest was arrested in Jaffna for celebrating the Mahaviru Day in defiance of court orders. Accordingly, the priest was produced before the Jaffna Magistrates Court today and released on a surety bail of 100,000 rupees. We will see you once more on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Now, Chairman of the Colombo Stock Exchange, Dumit Fernando, believes that the best solution to address local companies' dirt in financing when attempting to go global is to allow foreign currency to be raised at the Colombo Bourse. He made the claim while in discussion with Indira Yamwato on our current affairs program at Hyde Park on Adha Derna 24 earlier today, adding that the process to finalise the facility is at the last stages. You can watch a repeat of the full discussion at 1 p.m. on Monday, also on Adha Derna 24. Going forward about foreign investor participation and uh, taking Sri Lankan companies global, that is something we speak, how can the stock market yeah. play a massive role here? Because overseas, this is what we see. Yeah. But uh, here in Sri Lanka, we see something um, lagging, something pushing mm -hmm. them uh, behind that. And uh, what do you expect uh, in terms of government support? This issue of comp Sri Lankan companies going global is a very important matter for the country, obviously. But And then we look at our role and say, how do we facilitate that? So we, we started talking to a lot of companies, particularly exporters, uh, international companies. And we asked them, what are your biggest issues in, when you try to go international? And they said, it's financing. It's getting foreign currency financing. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a lot of them, raising you know, money in rupees on the stock exchange doesn't make a lot of sense if mm -hmm. they need to then invest that overseas because um, the capital controls uh, that are in existence will make it a bit more challenging. Um, so they have been looking at listing in overseas markets mm -hmm. or doing, you know, listing private equity in overseas markets to expand their company. So, you know, I think the obvious solution is for us to allow them on our market to raise foreign currency. Mm -hmm. So we have actually set, you know, passed a set of rules internally and we've identified that there are some exchange control regulations that we have to work with and we've engaged the central bank and the foreign currency department there and they have uh, done a tremendous amount of work. They've been extremely supportive in trying to facilitate this. I think people all the way up to the governor of the central bank have been paying attention to this matter. We're in the last stages of potentially getting that through. Yeah. So that's one tangible way we can help as mm -hmm. the stock exchange and we can be relevant. And and helpful to these companies. So rather than coming to the Colombo Stock Exchange with the option of only erasing rupee uh, financing, mm -hmm. they could potentially uh, list on a multi-currency board, which we have that board already, but it's only open for foreign companies at the moment. So we're basically trying to allow long, uh, Sri Lankan companies to uh, list on that and then hopefully use that capital to go global. The government has hit back at Fitch ratings over its downgrading of the country to CCC. The Minister of Finance said that the ratings action was puzzling since the well-articulated policy framework presented in the budget 2021 is receiving wider commendation for consistency and continuity with a clear medium-term view of fiscal consolidation on a realistic economic footing. It criticised the approach of the ratings agency as prejudicial and accused it of lacking due consideration to alternative strategies. Now, the concerns of Fitch are mainly centred on Sri Lanka's ability to service its debt. Fitch ratings yesterday downgraded Sri Lanka's long-term foreign currency issuer default rating to CCC. It said that the downgrade reflects Sri Lanka's increasingly challenging external debt repayment position over the medium term. In particular, a sharp rise in the sovereign debt-to-GDP ratio associated with the coronavirus shock and narrowing financing options have heightened debt sustainability risks. The ratings agency said, quote, We think there are now increasing risks to Sri Lanka's ability to meet its external debt repayments as reflected in our forecast of a steady decline in FX reserves in 2021 
2021 and 2022. We expect Sri Lanka's external liquidity ratio, defined as liquid external assets slash external liabilities, will remain low at about 63% against a CCC median of about 68% in 2021. Unquote. Fitch estimates Sri Lanka's government debt to GDP ratio to increase to about 100% in 2020 from 86.8% in 2019 and to rise further under its baseline scenario to around 116% in 2024. It also said that the budget 2021 lacks a credible fiscal consolidation strategy and provides only limited details on the potential revenue impact of some of the measures announced, raising uncertainty about the government's planned reduction in government debt and budget deficit. As such, Fitch said that it projects the budget deficit to widen to about 11.5% of GDP in 2021 and 2022, adding that the forecast is based on its own GDP growth assumption of 4.9% in 2021 compared to the authorities of 5.5 percent. The agency notes that Sri Lanka's low revenue to GDP ratio has remained a key weakness in the fiscal profile and that they expect it to remain below the CCC median of 23 percent in 2021. Meanwhile it also expects GDP to contract by 6.7 percent in 2020 and to begin recovering in 2021 by 4.9 percent partly driven by the low base effect. On banks in Sri Lanka, it says that the operating environment remains challenging and it expects banks' financial profiles to come under stress. In the meantime, reacting to the downgrade, the Sri Lankan government said that it is disappointing to observe the rating agencies such as Fitch Ratings expressing concerns about Sri Lanka's external debt repayment capacity over the medium term, financing options and debt sustainability risks at a time when the newly appointed government has just announced its medium-term policy framework in its budget 2020. The government rejected to accept the downgrade, saying that it fails to recognize the robust policy framework of the new government addressing the legacy issues, including the concerns raised by Fitch ratings and ensuring ongoing economic recovery and macroeconomic stability of the country. In a statement, the Minister of Finance said that it is surprising to note that Fitch ratings assessment has ignored several key proposals presented in the government budget 2021 with regard to deficit financing in the period ahead. As indicated in Budget 2021, the government has adopted a novel approach in relation to foreign financing while enhancing the effectiveness of already secured financing channels aimed at reducing the share of foreign financing of the budget deficit over the medium term. Yet, Fitch Ratings builds up its argument based on the existing financial model, thus adopting a backward-looking approach. In contrast, the backward-looking financing model of the government, which is skewed heavily towards domestic financing and will capitalise on the benefits of increased domestic savings and the low interest rate regime already in place given subdued aggregate demand conditions and well-anchored inflation expectations. Further, as the relative share of outstanding foreign debt has already fallen to 44% as per the latest available data, projecting a rise in foreign debt servicing obligations in the period ahead cannot be corroborated with facts. Based on such unfounded assumptions, Fitch ratings project a government debt to GDP ratio of 100% at end of 2020 and 116% at end of 2024, while grossly overestimating the budget deficit at around 11.5% of GDP in 2020. 2021 and 2022. The rating action announced is based on these ill-informed model projections without any evidence-based and objective analysis. The government also notes that it is puzzling why Fitch ratings downgraded Sri Lanka when the well-articulated policy framework presented in the budget 2021 is receiving wider commendation for consistency and continuity with a clear medium-term view of fiscal consolidation on a realistic economic footing. Such action, it said, simply demonstrates the prejudicial approach of Fitch ratings and lacks due consideration to alternative strategies that the government is committed to embark on in the period ahead. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.